Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 18th of April and joining me on this edition are Steve Withers. It's only forever, not long at all. News editor Mark Hodgkinson. Your mother is a fragged aardvark. And audio reviewer Ed Selly. How you turn my world, you precious thing. And we also have a special guest, Mark Botwright. Does anyone want to play a game of Scrabble? Not at the minute, thanks. So, welcome back, Mr. P. Uh, where have you been? Um, out there in the real world, in the scary non-AV forums world. You'll have to explain that a bit more because I don't care anyway. <laughs> Otherwise known as moving house and lots of other kind of very boring real world things. All oh, right. The music at the start, you might have recognised it if you're a certain vintage, um, like most of us on this podcast. Speak and for yourself. <laughs> and uh, sadly, Gareth Thomas, uh, who played Blake in Blake 7, uh, died this week. Not a very good year for celebrities that I grew up with this year. They all seem to be passing on in 2016. It's sad to see uh, uh, Mr Blake go. I think in years to come, people are going to look back and call 2016 the great celebrity cull, aren't they, really? <laughs> so many... Somebody seemed to pop their clogs. And we're only into what, mid- midway through April, and it's already been about 20 or 30 relatively well known, you know, and some very well known um, deaths. So yeah, maybe, so maybe we're just getting to that age now where everyone we know is starting to pop well, their clogs. I, I, gonna, I think gonna, it's gonna, getting to the stick stage my where. i out there and say it's the latter. Sorry. <laughs> just, just the well, it, it seems to be, Steve, that either in jail <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or they're dropping down dead. So a- anybody from the 70s and 80s that kind of grew up on celebrity-wise, yeah. That seems to be the two outcomes at the minute. But Blake 7, anybody remember it? Yeah, I loved it. I was I was a massive, massive, massive sci-fi fan as a kid. And back in the pre-Star Wars, there wasn't actually that much sci-fi around. So you no, I think what you could get. I think Star Wars kind of kicked it off again. Yeah, but it, there was really? Logan's Run was the year before. And I loved Logan's Run because basically I wanted to be a Sandman and kill runners. And it's like a good deal when I was 10, you know, do what you want for 20 years and then die at 30. When I got to 30, not so keen, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and you're well uh, past that now. The eights was the other big thing you had before Star Wars. But then after Star Wars, yeah, it all kicked off. And I love the BBC's ambition to try and make a, a, a sci-fi series on sod all budget. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, even if you look at the Star Trek from the 60s, the special effects romp all over it. I mean... What I think they did was that I think they relied on the animation department because everything seems to be two d- two dimensional drawings. The special effects, especially the spaceship, I can't remember what the spaceship was called. Oh, I love the, the Liberator. Design. Liberator, that's Liberator it. Looked really cool. It was a great design. Yeah, but it was but all yeah. t- it was all two D drawings though, and it was all animated as uh, like Mr. Ben, really. And I think they used the same <laughs> art department, didn't they? <laughs> Mr. Ben in space. <laughs> Mr. Ben died. Yeah. So <laughs> leave it. Um, I do remember my my dad has the had the complete series on VHS, and I remember him trying to encourage me to watch it when I was about sort of nine, and it was like, Dad, this is genuinely <laughs> just awful. laughed at him as he. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, don't get me wrong. Having since read a bit more about it, the ambition and actually the the world it sought to create was was really quite clever. But yeah, as you say, it was done on a budget of of four pounds fifty. Um, which kind of, kind of hindered it. At what point does ambition border on lunacy, though? Blake Seven. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a lot of the time. <laughs> no, I mean, the stories are fantastic, and the, and the ideas, like you say, were great. But um, basically, I've seen, I've seen they were just standing around waiting for Doctor Who to move out of that quarry so they could move in and do their shoot, because all the planets tend to look like forests or that quarry wherever they shot Doctor Who, because it was similar. Um, you know... I guess, but I still thought that there was a lot of uh, ideas in there, and and they were quite clever in the way that they worked around the fact they had absolutely no budget. Um, but what was obviously strange was that for half of uh, four seasons, Blake's only around for two of them. He disappears in season three after uh, Gareth Thomas was worried about getting typecast. I bet he regrets that. It's interesting. I mean, it, the only thing that has to be said about this this budget constraint, without Blake Seven, you'd have never had red dwarf because red dwarf essentially looked at all of the things before it was green lit by the bbc they basically brought out the things that were wrong with blake seven list Mm -hmm. and had rob grant and doug naylor um you know provide uh, logical responses to how they were going to avoid this being an issue so it was mainly shot indoors they'd already found someone who was prepared to knock up relatively convincing models all that sort of stuff and it just that in many ways uh, there's that quite significant gap 
in terms of the BBC's output and this sort of thing. And that's and, and that is and it was sort of effectively solved by Red Dwarf, which I always find quite interesting. Mark, do you remember it or are you a bit too young for that? I, I'm afraid I, I never saw it. The only thing I, I yeah, know about Blake Seven as points of reference is the budget and the final episode. Yeah. Beyond that. I, I I think the final episode was a was definitely a. I don't think we're ever going to get greenlit again. So um, so let's That's just, just not truthful apparently because I was thought that as well. I thought obviously they would just kill everybody, but in fact everyone apart from Blake, everyone's death is very ambiguous deliberately because they thought there might be a fifth season and then it turned out there wasn't going to be a fifth season. So it, and and on a very very ambiguous note, but um, so what what seems like a really clever ending actually was was meant to be a cliffhanger for the next season, apparently. Okay, I, I, I just want to test your knowledge here, Steve, and see how sad you actually are. Can you name any of the characters? Apart from oh, Blake? obviously Avon. Uh, Serverlan? Su, Su, Serverlan, yeah, Serverlan. Sulin, wasn't there a character called Sulin or something like that, I think? Um, what was the, was it Oracle? Was that the computer? Don't, don't ask us. Don't ask us. I, know, I haven't seen it since <laughs> 1981. <laughs> Yeah, but you've got one of these memories that you remember eh? absolutely every fine detail about a film, but if I ask you to do something, you forget about it. Yeah. I think that's just I, called getting old, Phil, isn't it? I can remember what I did 30 years ago, but I can't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be worrying if I was at that stage. Anyway, um, that's our memories of Blake Seven and, of course, Garth Thomas, who sadly passed away uh, last week when you listen to this. So, um, current competitions, what can we win, mm, Hodge? We have got our first ever... Ultra HD Blu-ray up for grabs, and Ooh. that's a copy of Mad Max Fury Road, which I'm waiting for Amazon.com to deliver. Uh, should be here any day. Looking forward to that. And we've also got, hence the quote at the start, a copy of Labyrinth on Blu-ray, and that's open to all members till the 9th of May. And uh, the Ultra HD Blu-ray? Oh, so that's, that's a little bit quicker for that one. you got to get in there for the, before the 28th of April. Who does? Active members. Okay, thank you. Any competition winners? Not this week. There's never any winners. Ask us that question after the <laughs> AV forums like thermodynamics for real. <laughs> maybe, maybe we just don't mention it when there's no other, other winners. Just gloss over it. I, I'm, I'm hopeful every week that there's going to be a winner. I, I really am. But if, got... You know, there's not. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, moving on swiftly. We talked about the K8500 Ultra HD Blu-ray player last week. Steve gave us a quick review. The review is now up on the website. It's on the homepage. Hodge, you got yours last week. Um, you've only got one disc, but what, uh, do, you th- but what do you think? Well, in terms of the hardware, I'll just echo what Steve said. Really, it's it's all right. It's it's you know it's not the best built box. It's a little bit plasticky. The remote's a little bit flimsy it looks all right but the buttons don't just don't feel right they're just a bit soft uh it's noisy for me far too noisy to be out in the open so i've uh, put mine back in its hole um yeah because the fan was really getting on my nerves yeah in terms of the the playback was easy i just plugged it into uh the receiver uh i've had no i had had problems with the receiver didn't i so i I plugged the audio into the receiver and the video straight into the panasonic dx 700 it all played hdr no problem straight away um, I think the only ch- the only setting I had to change was uh, bit streaming for the audio. It just it just worked fine, nice nice and speedy. I tested out the streaming performance because uh, my connection's up to it where Steve's isn't, uh, and that's really good. So it's got um, Netflix, Amazon, and YouTube on the homepage. Lots more to download through the App Store, but they all work really well. And quite unusually for uh, for a, for a media player, it switches um, refresh rates automatically dependent on content perfectly so it'll it'll sync with 24 25 30 50 60 frames per second depending on on what it is uh and and it looks great so yeah the the throughput on the uh router i did the netflix speed test which gave me 78 meg which is more than ample to handle any of the content on there uh and yeah i'm impressed with it and you know it's it does the job i wish it 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 was a bit quieter yes (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that fan is its one real it, it sort of down. I mean, aside from the fan, which is, which is noisy, frankly, um, although it depends on where you position your player, how close you are to it. De- like, depends what parts. frequencies you're you're you find annoying as well. Because for some people it'll be annoying, and for other people they won't really hear mm. it. So I mean, I, I don't hear it obviously when things are on and, and there's other noise and stuff. But obviously, if you've got a, a silent room, you, you can, and you're sat relatively close to it, you can hear it quite clearly. Um, so it will depend on where it is in the room. It will depend on your hearing. It will depend on a lot of things. But but there is a, a fan in the back, and it is quite noisy. That is the one thing. Otherwise, though, 
as Mark's just said, I think what the good thing about the K500 is, that, you know, it's, it really is plug and play. Basically, you buy it, you plug it in, and you're off to the races. And you don't really have to do very much at all in terms of setting it up to get great performance out of it. I mean, it does almost everything for you, which means given that that player is very much aimed at the mass market, shall we say, and I know that's probably not true for Ultra HD Blu-ray, but people that aren't going to say know what HDR is, people that aren't going to necessarily understand um, things like, you know, wider color spaces and, and 4K necessarily, they just have to plug it in and, and as long as they, and it will do whatever it needs to do for their TV. So if the TV supports HDR, they get HDR experience. If it's an SDR TV, a 4K SDR TV, it will down convert it to SDR. And it does that very well as well. So I think in that sense, it's, it's a winner for, um, for, for the market that it's aimed at. In fact, you've probably got more setup to do on the TV side, don't you? You've probably Absolutely. got a couple of settings to change there <laughs> rather than, than on the player. I think I think the TV side is where where people are going to start getting a little bit confused in terms because there are a couple of controls and, and one of them is it's very specific, which is uh, it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. But certainly on, for example, Samsung, they call it HDMI UHD color. And you need to make sure that's on. Now, on the 2016 TVs, that will automatically happen. But it doesn't happen automatically on the older models. So you need to go in and uh, into the menu and actually select that. There is a, a similar control on the LG OLEDs, for example. Bizarrely, though, they buried that in the general menu <laughs> rather than the picture menu, which makes no sense to me at all. So and I think Panasonic people, have as well. Now. That's yes. Set, that's and people aren't going to know that's there. They're never going to... I mean, that's. I think that's where people are going to uh, have tricky situations, I think. Because I noticed... The uh, Samsung, um, you know, because because it was doing automatic, I hadn't bothered turning it on for uh, for the KS9500. When I plugged in the UB900, because it wasn't on, the UB900 thought it was an SDR TV until I turned it on, and then it and it detected it as an HDR TV. So some some interesting little idiosyncrasies and foibles here that people are going to experience, uh, and I think it unfortunately will be slightly confusing for a lot of the you know general consumers out there who who really just want to just plug and play. Or some of us that haven't got players and feeling left out. Well, have you got a display to play it on? No, at the minute. <laughs> Details. Yeah, <laughs> Details. Well, it'll make a cracking 1080p uh, SDR player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so you had the, the DMP UB900, which is the Panasonic player. Um, yeah. We've been waiting on this one because I think Samsung have, have really gone for the plug-and-play, whereas Panasonic have certainly gone for... The enthusiast market in terms of build quality, uh, analog audio out, decent darks, etc. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question that um, the UB900 is, is aimed very much at the enthusiast market. I would just say in terms of build quality, uh, a lot of people have criticised the Samsung, but it isn't that bad. It's, when you pick it up, it's pretty solid and it's reasonably well made. And in fact, in actual fact, the UB900, although it's a more traditional looking design, you know, basically a rectangular black box, and it's quite attractive, and it is well made. It isn't that much better than the K850. Where, where it is different, obviously, is that the, the actual um, disc tray is a bit smoother and quieter, and there's no noisy fan. That's very much the case. So that factor alone is, is good. It has got a display on the front, but all it does is show you the time, you know, the, the time of the movie. Um, and you can obviously turn it off. So I don't think that's a big deal. But it does have a really, really, I mean, this is kind of appeals to the geek in me, but it's got a fantastic on-screen uh, information display so, uh, which shows you what the player is receiving and exactly what the player is outputting both in terms of video and in terms of audio and i really really like that that's a nice little feature uh, remote control is the, the standard big remote that comes with their other um sort of higher end blu-ray players and in fact actually looking at the display it's obviously the same display that they use on other, other players too because it's got lots of little um you can see when you light it up that there's a uh, dot matrix stuff for things that aren't on this player. So obviously it's just a standard uh, display they put in. And the remote control though is nice. It's, it's comfortable, it's backlit, which is very handy. Um, and everything you need is on there. So that's great. Uh, in terms of the rear connections, you've got uh, two HDMI outputs, same as the, the, the Samsung. Uh, obviously the idea is you've got one for uh, um, your display uh, and you can send both video and audio to the display if that's the case or through a receiver if it supports everything. Uh, if it doesn't, then you've got the second output to send audio to your receiver or soundbar uh, and just send the video straight to your display from the from the first HDMI output. Interestingly, although it says on the actual output, uh, first output's uh, main one uh, is video audio and the second one's audio only, in fact, actually, you can connect that to uh, a 1080p device and it will output 1080p over that um, HDMI output. So At that's the same buried... time? Uh, no. Right. Not simultaneously. Um, <laughs> that, be really that information is buried in the manual, by the way, uh, and is not made very obvious when you actually look at the player, but that is the case. There's also um, uh, double, um, so we've got, we've got, um, optical digital output and a cracked digital output, and 
uh, separate stereo outputs, um, RC outputs for um, left and right, um, you know, analog stereo, and then a full 7.1 analog um, output as well. Uh, now, I'm not entirely sure how many people are going to use that these days. Um, you know, obviously, uh, from Panasonic's perspective, you know, they're, they're making a player that's meant to be high-end enthusiast with audiophile components. Um, but I suspect the majority of people, even enthusiasts, are actually going to be using the HDMI outputs. Um, they do recommend, I don't know, <laughs> I'd take this with a pinch of salt, but they're saying, oh, use audio for, um, use one HDMI for video and one HDMI for audio because you'll get better audio that way and turn off the display because that'll make the audio better. I, I think maybe, I, I certainly haven't noticed any difference doing that. Um, but uh, they certainly are aiming it at, at um, both the video file and the audio file in terms of its um, audio capabilities, which is impressive. Uh, there's at the front, there's a big drop down flap. And then behind that, there's an SD card slot and a USB port as well. So that's the the player. In terms of performance, um, you know, it's absolutely stellar. It does everything it should do. It is the first player. It's it's, it's um, certified. It's the first certified 4K source by THX, and also it's certified as the first certified um, Ultra HD Blu-ray player by the UHD Alliance for the UHD Premium. Having said that, I think I think that's just a question of timing because, as far as I can tell from from the requirements for that certification, so with the K8. Five hundred qualify, so I think it's more just a case of that hadn't been announced until this week. But in terms of performance, it's great. It's it's it, it's a fantastic Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Uh, it's a great Blu-ray player. You know whether it's two D or three D. Also, it's a great CD player, DVD player. The scaling is excellent. I mean, it's a it's a really quality player. Um, you know, Panasonic know what they're doing when it comes to this kind of stuff, uh, and and they really deliver. One of the interesting things is that if the the player player does detect that your TV is SDR and not HDR. It will like the like the um, Samsung down convert. But unlike the Samsung, it actually gives you an option to adjust the conversion depending on the peak brightness of your TV. Because obviously uh, the player knows the TV is an HDR, but that's all it knows. It doesn't know anything else about the TV's capabilities because um, that information isn't there. So what Samsung have gone for is basically a general approach of creating a, what they would consider to be a good-looking down-converted image that will apply to, you know, just about any TV that the player ends up being connected to that isn't HDR. Uh, with the um, with the Panasonic, you can adjust it between 100 and 1,000 nits. Now, I don't think there are going to be too many non-HDR players that are hitting 1,000 nits, but, but by adjusting it, you can obviously tailor it to suit your TV precisely, assuming you know what the peak brightness of your television is. But I, I, obviously, that, that's a very esoteric control that's certainly not going to apply to the majority of the mass market out there. Again, it's a sort of a tweaky control that, that, um, that enthusiasts can play around with. Um, and that's very much, and, and like you said at the beginning, Phil, this is very much an enthusiast player. So it priced at five nine nine, so it's one hundred seventy pounds more than the uh, than the uh, Samsung. Um, the Samsung comes with a copy of The Martian, and the UB nine hundred comes with a copy of Mad Max Fury Road and San Andreas. So the question becomes really: Is did you think it's uh, do you, can you justify the additional cost? Uh, this one hundred seventy pounds. That's entirely a personal choice. Uh, certainly, um, I like the the more classic. Uh, design of, of the player itself. Um, I think in an equipment rack it looks better. Uh, although I've got to say that the uh, the K eight five hundred is starting to grow on me in terms of its look. I, th I think it's still quite stylish in its own way. Um, it's probably just not as traditional looking as as the uh, as the uh, Panasonic. But certainly, uh, I think for an enthusiast, uh, yeah, the Panasonic probably will will be the player of choice because it's, it's got more, more more flexibility and there's also more options in terms of the audio side of things as well um but i think for the mass market for the general plug and play market uh, the, the samsung is better positioned i think you're probably going to see um not now because stock's a bit light at the minute but i think what you're probably going to see is bundle deals with these things so yeah i, I don't think unless you're you're uh, definitely a, a, an early adopter and in there straight away and buying these things um I think when it comes to bundles and that kind of thing, I, th I think you're going to see them bundled in with TVs and so on. So there's not going to be that many people that are paying full price for these, I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't have thought so. It would also be interesting to see uh, about availability because I get the impression there aren't, you know, that what they have, you know, what they've made and the shipping are getting sold straight away because, you know, obviously, although we've been saying for a long time, that, you know, we're not expecting Ultra HD Blu-ray to be, a, you know, a massive mass market success. Certainly, there is enough of an enthusiast market out there that will buy these players straight away. That we could see the stocks being quite, um, you know, quite limited initially, at least, yeah. um, which will probably delay the, the opportunity to actually do packaging and bundle deals and that sort of stuff. Okay, what did you give the UB nine hundred? Highly recommend. It. Okay, no need to read the review then, folks. You've you've had it all now. Every every, every finite detail. 
of the player there. Uh, right, so let's stick with HDR. That's the two players out of the way. Um, the review will be up on the site by the time you listen to this podcast. Uh, Netflix are going to start streaming HDR content, Mark. Apparently they already have, but we haven't actually got first-hand evidence of them doing so. They didn't make any announcements about it. It just it leaked out. From... Have, you, have you got that Sony TV yet? Uh, yeah, the Sony's on the way. Apparently it is available on the uh, high-end Sony's from this year and last year uh, and will emerge onto other platforms uh, in the next few days. I believe the Panasonic's getting an update on the 19th of April Yeah, uh, and, and others will n- no doubt follow. So, uh, yeah, as billed by Netflix some time ago, uh, probably six, seven months ago, back in 2015, they are sending out Marco Polo, the first season of, in HDR. And that's uh, HDR 10. Uh, as well HDR as 10. Is that confirmed, HDR 10? Do well, we know? It, well, it has to be HDR 10, even if it's got Dolby Vision, because Dolby true. Vision sits on top of HDR 10, so it can't exist without it. Yeah. Uh, they did They did say they were going to do Dolby Vision, didn't they, at, uh, at CES? Now, whether when, when that's going to happen, we're not sure. But, uh, yeah, at some point they will be doing Dolby Vision 2 and Dolby Atmos, uh, which I think will be based on Dolby Digital Plus yeah, 7.1. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, hopefully I will be watching Marco Polo in HDR tonight. So uh, I, I actually I've watched the first series up until episode seven, and then I thought, ah, oh, sod it, I'm just going to wait for an HDR TV now to, <laughs> to finish it off. So I've got, yeah, I've got to say, I'll, even I'll, even in SDR, it looks it's, amazing, it's doesn't it? Brilliantly shot, it really is. It looks beautiful. It really does. He's, I I didn't want to be a fanboy when we, when we were speaking to him, but I did have to say to Vanya that I thought that. Uh, it looked beautiful, and it and it does. I mean, the the play on light and the natural lighting and so on that that's used, especially indoors, um, looks phenomenal with the detail in the in the black level and stuff. Really good, and that's SDR. So HDR will look really really nice. I, I would say it was the best streamed video I've ever seen uh, in SDR. So uh, how how much it can improve in HDR will be very interesting to see, and hopefully I'll be able to just do some flicking back to back and have a have a quick look at that. I was going to say, didn't um. Vanya say in the interview that, that he was grading it at 2,000 nits, I think. Was that right, Phil? Yeah, it's about that. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I'm jealous. Can't uh, experience that for myself. Well, it'll, uh, be it'll, 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 yeah, it'll be out on disc. Yeah, it'll be out on disc. I was going to say you're going to have a Panasonic next weekend on the on the 19th, but <laughs> it's yeah, no good for unfortunately. you. <laughs> no good for you. You're still waiting on the internet. Right, so moving things on and staying with 4K and HDR, but this time we're going to turn to games because we've got Mr. Botwright back on the podcast. It's great to have you back, Mark. Cheers, Phil. So, the PS4K, is this a rumour or is this going to come to fruition? Um, well, it depends very much who you believe. Um, as with all things, it, it started out, obviously, as kind of half rumour. It was um, started out with Kotaku, said that PlayStation 4.5 was being referred to as PS4K by developers and that this was something that was in the works. Um, obviously, that kind of tends to snowball into you know various other online forum rumors and the like. Um, Eurogamer, though, confirmed that it was, it was something, um, though the issue right now is what it is. Um, it seems like it could potentially be various different... Uh, sources, various different rumours being kind of conflated. It could be um, early things to do with the PlayStation 5. It could be simply a UHD Blu-ray enabled PlayStation 4. Um, Likely bet, uh, from my point of view, would be some kind of bump in um, processing power, GPU, CPU, um, and to try and bridge that gap between the native um, resolution it's rendering and to push kind of 4K sets and 4K Blu-ray. Um, it, it seems as if in an ideal world, maybe if, if 4K Blu-ray had come sooner, then you would see the, the PS4 being enabled for that. But as it is, it just seems to kind of make sense now. Put out another box if you if they're the market leader. So it's a nice way to entice, say, you know, tech enthusiasts to get into gaming. It's a nice way to kind of get those people who already have 4K sets maybe to double dip you know, buy a, a kind of mid-generation refresh console. Um, but as for all the other rumours that potentially it could be, you know, entirely a new SKU, whether it's going to kind of fragment the user base, I, th- I think Sony would be slightly mad to do that. You know, you're already sitting on top of kind of 45 million sales. You don't want to almost cut them off when the generation's got another kind of, probably at least another three or four years to go. The problem with Sony is 
certainly Sony Electronics, um, maybe not so much the gaming side, but they have no interest, it seems, in producing a player, a 4K player, because they want to do their own thing. And, and their recent announcement was that you can buy 4K content and have it streamed to your Sony TV uh, in the US, and I believe it was $30 a, a stream or something like that. I mean, Sony, are, they're a really strange company. They're a company that was behind Blu-ray and the development of Blu-ray, yet they seem to have no interest whatsoever in UHD Blu-ray and, and certainly haven't given us any indication that, that they're going to release a player in the next year or so anyway. So that's from the home electronics side. So, so if they're playing it a bit coy, it'd be strange if the PS4 was then to suddenly have a, a UHD Blu-ray drive yeah, well, I mean, they did they not show off? They didn't show off anything at CES, did they? They didn't kind of no give they, any plans. No, absolutely what no they, plans whatsoever for. for they said UHD they want to player. unify all the all the divisions, so this could be a, a way of doing that by um, by having the the, uh, the game in together with the Blu-ray player, as they did with the PS3. To be fair, I mean, obviously that was a that was a big launch for uh, for the original Blu-ray. Uh, I can I can see it being a little bit more powerful on the game inside but i don't think they'll they'll do too much to upset the apple cart because that's going to annoy developers as well as users because uh, that'll just that'll just make things even harder um but i think it'll be a a 4k console capable uh, capable of hdr video and the wider color, color gamuts and, and blu-ray playback as well Well, maybe it's a case of they're not going to do a standalone player because they think that the ps4 is the platform to launch that then mm. yeah that's why i well, think it makes a nice value kind of option, doesn't it? Because if you've got a 4K set, if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking, should I buy, you know, I might buy a games console, I might buy a, you know, 4K Blu-ray player, then it, it, it just kind of almost sells itself. Um, I was also reading a, a thing the other day about a, an old interview with Netflix that's saying that they'd, they'd apparently been promised a revised PS4 for this, that this was, you know, kind of on the cards for a while. So, you know, potentially there's something in that as well. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I haven't got a PS4 myself, but I, I'm assuming that the video platforms are on there, the likes of uh, Netflix. Yeah, so everything. if they were going to have an, an update for 4K, then they would need more processing power, would they not, Mark? Um, well, I, I think most of the, the, with regards to 4K media, um, I, I don't know whether it would need any kind of extra processing power. Um, I think that a lot of the, the questions at the moment are around... HDMI and HDCP 2.2 about how much can be done with regards uh, updates and also with regards how much um, you know kind of data can be sent through it if if it's you know kind of HDMR uh, sorry HDR um, enabled so it's it's really kind of muddied the waters and and as I say all of these kind of different rumors have have got a lot of people focusing on different things um, you know some even think it might be a kind of a Sony moving towards this kind of iterative route with consoles, similar to how you have phones. So you know you will get mid-generation refreshes and continual power bumps with an eye with one eye on kind of forwards compatibility and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it just it just seems to tick all the right boxes for it to be some kind of a 4K box. You know, sell again to people who've already upgraded their TVs now. Now that 4K is starting to get a bit more momentum, and so yeah, it just seems like the easy sell. No. We're talking about the video side of things, but what about gaming? I mean, are, are you likely to see games released as 4K versions? No. No, um, it, it, it's still tough. You still need a, a, a very, very good PC to do that um, on anything that's kind of, you know, graphically intensive. Um, you're not going to see that with... Um, I, I very, very much doubt you will ever see that with, you know, PS4 titles the likelihood seems that it will just be a case of maybe you'll get more stable uh, frame rates maybe you will see um you know that bump to kind of bridge the gap between the the native resolution and your 4k panel um but you're not going to see like you know the latest playstation 4 game in 4k that would just be you know you would need the processing power of kind of the next generation of consoles and possibly then some it would be a noisy beast, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it would. 4K game. It'll heat your room, though. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems too tempting, given its name, not to call it a PS, PS4K. It seems like an obvious marketing gimmick. Well, we actually mentioned that before the PS4 was released years ago, didn't we? So yeah, yeah. Will they call it a PS4K? Obviously, the the, uh, the hardware wasn't around at the time to support that, but obviously, you know, things change quite rapidly, don't they, in the computing world? So, but yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I cannot. It will not be doing 4K gaming. Maybe 1080p gaming with uh, HDR might be quite an interesting option, though. Yeah, that's a possibility, isn't it? Yeah. I, I kind of just say that when I went to the Sony launch last February, they did say they planned to have an Ultra HD Blu-ray player in the market 
by the end of their financial year, which in the case of Sony would be the 31st of March next year. And the case of Sony, <laughs> in time, case of Sony 2018. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite interesting because one of the, the kind of rumours seems to have emanated from people with links with retail and that, that the rumour is kind of, you know, whether retail have been told not to kind of order too many more of PS4s as it is or whether it's a question of dumping old stock. I mean, as I say, all these things could be kind of conflated into one. You could be seeing a PS4K. You could also be, you know, they could be reading just a, a PS4 Slim as well. And people are assuming that, you know, getting stop ordering all the PS4s, one rumour kind of melds into another. There's... You know, some people say it's out there with developers. Someone else has reached out. I think it was uh, with uh, Digital Foundry, the Eurogamer, saying that, you know, some people in Sony were surprised at the rumor themselves and hadn't even heard of it. So it, it could be nothing or you could be playing, you know, UHD Blu-rays, you know, by Christmas on a on a new PS4. It just seems like a really obvious thing for them to do, doesn't it, to me? They'd be mad not to be, at least be sounding people out about it. And yeah. that's how these things tend to usually leak out, which is they they sound people out and then someone takes it as, as fact that it, it's it's happening and it's happening soon. But they, they must have planned around this. Yeah. I did, the only thing that they're going to miss out on is perhaps the, the hipster market. Maybe they could do a, a vinyl add-on that you plug in. <laughs> I wouldn't count that out. I would not count that out. <laughs> I wonder if you could do games on turntable. <laughs> we had cassettes before. Why can't you? Yeah, that's very true. You, you, you did have cassettes. To be fair, the cassette cassettes a kind of cult in their own right I'm, I'm sure that somebody somewhere is going to work out a way of getting that back into into producing you know Horace Goes Skiing for 20, 2016 <laughs> You know what Ed it wouldn't surprise me because I mean the main thing at the minute is uh, the whole hipster thing it, you know it's cool to be I mean I was walking through Newcastle City Centre um, a couple of weeks ago and I saw a site that I haven't seen since the early 90s and that was people Someone walking, wearing a coat Well yeah there was that <laughs> At the top <laughs> Uh, you do joke, but it's normally a, 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 an annual headline up here is please people buy a coat. Um, no, I, it was a site I hadn't seen since the early 90s, and that was people walking around with plastic carrier bags with 12-inch records inside them, uh, albums inside them. I saw loads of them, loads of them, and they were, they were all youngsters as well. I mean, you know, my, my preconception... <laughs> Is is a vinyl collector nowadays is, is usually in his thirties or forties and, and and it's a nostalgia thing and, and it's a, a very nerdy thing for sound quality and all the rest of it. But it it seems to be that people are buying these cheap seventy pound record players that you can pick up in HMV uh, that will destroy your vinyl if you ever try to play vinyl on them. Buying these things and buying vinyl or buying vinyl and just not listening to it and listening to the digital version while looking at the gatefold sleeve. On the front of the mailer Sunday last week, I was out at the indoors, by the way. We don't, I don't buy I was going to say, you I don't buy that. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. Uh, there was at the top, the, above the uh, the banner, was buy this record player for twenty nine ninety nine as part of the Daily Mail, oh, sorry, Sunday yeah. Mail um, yeah. readers deal. On the front of the Sunday Mail. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's absolutely ruined the vinyl. It really would. Yeah, twenty nine ninety nine. That'd be a good one, wouldn't it? Buy a turntable and a record of Hitler's speeches. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> bundled with it. <laughs> you weren't on last week's podcast, Ed, but um, are you still thinking of buying um, a B six an LG B six? I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I've got to do you know some fiscally responsible things first, like ensure that spending three thousand pounds on a television doesn't lose me my house and you know other trifling details but yes it is the first the first of the the 4k televisions where it it you know the spec looks stable enough and so on and so forth i won't rule it out but um at the moment uh i've got to as i say i've got to square away my personal finances well but, you, could, you yeah. could just go dry for a couple of months and that would be it paid for yeah, but then if I go dry, I will spend three thousand pounds on records. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, three thousand pounds of records will probably still be worth something after two years, whereas the television will be off to the tip. So, okay. Yeah. So again, music streaming. It seems to be for some reason it's boosting the sale of vinyl. Explain it. This sounds bizarre, but when you think about it, um, it makes perfect sense. It avoids what I have personally termed and people are welcome to use it as long as they credit me the babylon zoo effect um if we think back to that levi's advert from many many years ago which featured a sample a section of spaceman the, the, the biggest babylon. rip off of all time you mean ed because the song was nang like that 
precisely the the first 30 seconds is amazing and the rest of it was absolute chud now when you're buying vinyl it's ex it's expensive there's no getting around this you're talking a minimum of 12 or 13 pounds for an album and often considerably more for a new album i stress use is a bit different um simply using a streaming service and you're not even necessarily being a paid subscriber to do this it just gives you the opportunity to listen to the album in its entirety at, you know reduced quality but nonetheless you get a feel for whether it's just got one blinding track or 30 seconds of one blinding track and you can go do you know what that's good enough i want one of those or actually do you know what there's that one track it's all right i might either continue to just listen to it on a streaming service or buy it in some other cheaper form so essentially streaming services are acting as a filter for for, for many vinyl users i count myself as one a number of my friends uh, are the same as are people i encounter on on various forums including obviously our own so i've, I've got to say i i am like that i've had title for Six months now. When was Tidal launched? Because I think I think I've had Tidal since. Probably longer than that. Longer yeah, it's been getting on for late 2014 when I reviewed it. I think. Yeah. So I mean, I've had Tidal, and and to be honest, um, I've listened to a few things on there, and um, if I'm listening in the car, what I normally do is is obviously offline it, which you can do with Tidal and a couple other things. Um, but if it's a really good, I've actually been picking up the CDs. So there's there's yeah. a number of CDs that I've picked up because. Um, I've listened to it over and over and over again on Tidal, really like it, and then I've been in HMV or wherever, it's usually Tesco's actually, um, and it's it's like five, six quid for the CD and I've picked it up. So I've yeah. actually gone and bought bought the music, even though I have it free, well not really free because it's monthly charge, but um, I can listen to it whenever I like on streaming, but I've gone out and actually bought the CD for some strange reason. And this is an argument that streaming services are making when it comes to the thorny issue of royalties, that actually artists but benefit from streaming services cannot be calculated simply in the royalties that they're paying the artists, which we all know are, with the possible exception of Tidal, pretty low. Um, so, yeah, I mean, essentially, there are any number of um, any number of albums where this is the case, and in many ways, Spotify has really kicked this up a notch. The um, the Discover Weekly playlist that it throws out, curated for you each Monday. That's that's a very dangerous thing. Thirty of the thirty tracks there, I will generally hear something and I'll go, "That's bloody excellent." And more often than not, that leads to some form of purchase or greater involvement, or so on and so forth. Um, I mean, Tidal have got some cracking playlists of their own, but they don't come around as often as that curated Spotify one. Um, and yeah, it 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 might not be immediately boosting the artist's coffers when they're featured on that playlist, but my word, it will make a difference when, you know, when I start buying the physical media of it. You'll want your hobby back soon though, Ed, won't you? you you'll be wanting it I to... have, uh, I'm, I'm in two minds about this. I mean, essentially I have enjoyed the, the, the boost it's given to the, the retail process and actually with more vinyl being out there, there's also there is more attention being paid to quality control. I mean, the quality of the actual material um, being released is is significantly better. I do think that unless somebody finds a way to offer a cost-effective step from these eighty-pound standalone record ploughing machines to uh, you know a more sensibly priced longer lived record player yes essentially it, it it's it's not self-sustaining it will burn out and there will be problems from there but yeah i mean you know I, i'm good i'd say i've had a, just had a a record delivered the, today i mean including shipping um under a tenner it's in lovely condition it's it's still possible i mean essentially a, a number of albums which i should have got round to buying four or five years ago i haven't they're now priced uncomfortably high but you know, you you win some, you lose some. That's the, that's the nature of it. I'm I'm in many ways. It's it's nice just to be not considered absolutely weird for once in my life. Yeah, but it's gone from being an interesting little thing that you'd say down in the pub, and people would be interested in that, that now that everybody in the pub. <laughs> Well, they, there is there is this assumption that you 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 know you're some sort of bandwagon jumper. You, I remember I was fishing through um, 
fishing through some some bins at a record fair and shut up and um the the old guy who was man in the stand it's like i oh, said so, so you know what, what what turntable have you got and i said well <laughs> i've got a couple um and you know reeling it off it's like oh oh so you've been doing this a while then? Yes, you know, not all of us have, you know, turned up to do this in the last 25 minutes. But yeah, <laughs> you, there is an element of that. But, you know, a lot of these people are, you know, taking it taking it quite seriously and they are buying some good stuff. And from, you know, from the manufacturer perspective, people who are turning out good quality, new, sensibly priced turntables are, are going to do all right out of it. Um, we've got another turntable review coming up at some stage today, probably during this podcast, because that's what they do, um, I've got um, a uh, uh, the the latest Riga Planer 3 turning up for evaluation. And we're How much see is that, Ed? That is 550 without a cartridge mm. and £625 with a cartridge. So once, a, years and years ago, I always really wanted a Riga. So. Well, we, we need to see if it's still, if it's still got the edge, yeah. if it's still got the magic. So that's what the review is going to do. It's an opportunity to take some cracking picks as well and um yeah we'll see we'll see if it still justifies being that little bit more expensive than some of its rivals and i guess just to wrap on this subject i have to ask our special guest uh, this afternoon uh, mark any intentions of buying a, a turntable or do you actually have one and are you a vinyl collector uh no no i don't have one but uh, to to be honest with the kind of record store day and and all the stuff kind of uh you know you get a lot of marketing stuff emailed through yes it it, it still is tempting Largely because I've, I've kind of downsized with regards speakers elsewhere, and that usually kind of kickstarts me into thinking uh, maybe, maybe I should start again. Um, yeah, there are a, a few a few um, vinyls still kept, but other than that, um, yeah, we'll just have to see. So, what records would you buy? Um, I t- the th- the things that I would buy would be things that I find very jarring to listen to when it's it's digital. Um, I, I find particularly kind of old folk, old blues, that kind of thing. There's something really, some kind of disconnect in my head when I'm listening to something on MP3. You know, you're listening to kind of an old, you know, like Robert Johnson record or something like that, and it's got the hisses, it's got the pops, it's got the crackle and that kind of thing, an old Woody Guthrie record or something like that, and it somehow just something feels wrong about hearing it just digital. It just just feels just strange. Well, I mean, anything recorded for analog still, by and large, does sound pretty damn good on analog. There's a lot to be said for that. And I'd buy the the Shogun Assassin soundtrack as well. (laughs) (laughs) Which was released for Record Store Day a couple of years ago. Was it really? heartbreakingly expensive. Um, (laughs) Yeah. No, it's it's down to about 20 quid you can get it now, secondhand. Some some places with blood red uh, version, that's the one I think that, that costs a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, props to the Clear Audio distributor in the UK who was playing that at the Bristol show to a group of very confused 50-year-old men. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, I think even even for a, an AV Forums podcast, we're really out-nerding ourselves at this moment in time. So uh, let's move things on and movie reviews is next. So moving on to movies and uh, what films are coming up this Friday and are you going to get off your arse and actually go to the cinema and review one? Well, I could go to the cinema and review one, Phil, but wouldn't I be reviewing it a week later than it's after it's come out? <laughs> no, what, what you need to do is... recording need, on a Friday and well, they come out to, today. You need to go on the Thursday night then. That's what yeah, you need to do. If it's showing on a Thursday night, which isn't actually that common. Although, uh, speaking of that, I am going to see um, Captain America's Civil War at midnight on Thursday the 20... 20- 8th of of um, April. So that one I will be reviewing on the on the podcast. Uh, as far as next week's or this Friday rather this Friday's opening film's opening it's Bastille Day which is a thriller with Idris Elba as a spy running around Paris. Um, Idris Elba's always very watchable so I'd be quite happy to go and see that. And also Jane Got a Gun which is an interesting film it's it's a western starring Natalie Portman as a woman basically getting revenge. Uh, that was actually shot, I think, a couple of years ago. It's been sitting around on the shelf for quite a long time, waiting for a distributor. But it finally comes out this Friday. Um, uh, and I think Kaz is going to be reviewing that one because he's been waiting for this film. He's quite a big Western fan. He's been waiting for this film for some time now. Uh, and uh, Sharuna will be reviewing Bestial Day. So that's what's coming out this Friday. Okay, so Blu-rays? There's, there's only one Blu-ray this week. It's obviously Star Wars. 
The Force Awakens, finally arrives. I came out in the US on the 5th of April, comes out today, the 18th of April uh, in the UK. Um, the, as far as I can tell, the discs are identical, so you're getting um, 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, 7.1 channel audio, and a bunch of extras, including a 69-minute documentary about the making of the film. Who's got it on order? Uh, well, actually, um, it's, it, it, people will be listening to this podcast. Um, it's now in the shops, people. Go and get it. Mm-hmm. Go and get it. Uh, I'll be picking mine up on Monday. I was going to pre-order and all the rest, and I thought, that's just easy to jump in the car. Just wander and, down to the supermarket. Well, it, it's 24 hours, so you, know, you could go along and pick it up whenever. Yeah, yeah I've got to go to Tesco's. I've got to buy some more trousers, and I might pick up stole at the same time. <laughs> trousers the tree. Oh. You're going to buy, so, you're gonna buy some sorry. records as well. No, I, I, as I say, I, I Tesco, it's one of those things where I just need uh, a quick and cheap pair of trousers. And whilst I don't like buying food from Tesco, actually they do perfectly serviceable sweatshop clothing. So, not a winner. <laughs> They've always got some great Star Wars t-shirts and that kind of thing. And, um, I, actually, I've, do you know what? They've got some them. cracking ones for kids. Will has been, I, he, I don't know if he's interested in Star Wars or not, but he's got a lot of Star Wars clothing. They've got some really good T-shirts. Yeah. I, I saw a good one the other, the other week. There, it was a number one Star Wars fan, and it was the Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, that that's been doing it. the 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 one that I bought for a friend that I really quite liked. You know, the I Heart New York one. Yeah. Uh, there, there was I, and then a picture of a Death Star Alderaan, which I thought was <laughs> quite, quite good. That's excellent. And yeah. the, the other, obviously, the picture doing the rounds at the moment that I love, I sent it to Steve, is um, it's got still at the shot of the shot at the end of um, Force Awakens with Ray holding out Luke's lightsaber and him looking back. And it's just at the caption, there was a hand too. Did you find the hand? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was brilliant. So, yeah. uh, Phil, you're getting it. Uh, Ed, you're getting it. Mark and Mark, are you going to get I'm undecided, to be honest. I might buy it and pick it up on impulse, but I'm in no rush. I'm, I've already become a uh, 4K HDR snob, so I'll just wait, <laughs> for, <laughs> just wait for that release in the course of a week. On, on, on one disc. Yeah, <laughs> based on one disc. I'm patient. I'll wait. <laughs> I can see uh, myself, the timing of how I do video hardware, I can see myself getting a reasonable use out of the 2K Blu-ray and probably being ready to buy the 4K box set <laughs> when all three of them have been done. So, uh, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll be on 8K by then. Probably. And I'll, I'll be enjoying 4K and I'll get the same conversation. Like, Eddie, considering buying things, oh, I've got things to buy, you know, records, probably. Mark Very B, consistent. Are you, uh, are you getting it? Uh, I, I will probably cave at some point when I see it uh, in a supermarket. It is one of those things that you, you tend to not plan to buy, but then at some point, you uh, you know, just chuck it in your basket. Have you seen it? I haven't yet, actually. I, I didn't manage to get to see it, unfortunately. Ooh. Oh, sorry, Mark. Spoilers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've seen the first uh, that... one. <laughs> it's just like that. Nah, it doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point, Mark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is why I'm so much more hopeful for Rogue One. Rogue One looks brilliant; it really does. I've, I, does I've lost count how many be, times I watched that trailer now. People can't aren't going to be as precious. And that. and there's a great um, I don't know if you've seen it on Tidal, but there's a great album out, and it's um, it's all the stuff that stuff that you would appreciate, Ed. You know, like electronica and that. Oh, it's the remixes. Um, the it's all the Star Wars got. stuff. Yeah, Roy, oh, Bounty, Bounty Hunters, Bounty Hunters is a and, monumental uh, yeah. record. I'm not necessarily blown away by the rest of it, but the Bounty Hunters is a cracking tune. Uh, I need to find my uh, superlicious NYC Star Wars breakbeats, which was a completely unauthorized, unauthorized and dubiously legal. And do you know what? I think I've got that on CD. It's mighty. The um, version of um, Stevie Wonder's Have a Talk with God overspersed with uh, Yoda is, 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 is a tune for <laughs> oh, the that sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We have wandered off on a tangent again, haven't we, gentlemen? Well, that wouldn't be unusual. No, no, I suppose. Particularly when you're on the podcast, Ed. Oh, right. Okay, so you get snappy at me when I don't turn up for the podcast last week. It's like, now I do turn up for the podcast, I'm a distraction and I should stop. No, no, it's always welcome. Always welcome. Always welcome. So I, I, I'm intrigued why uh, you haven't seen this, Mr. Botwright. Because I, I thought you were a bit of a Star Wars fan, you know? It, you know what? It was a mixture between uh, the hassle of getting out to the cinema in, in amongst kind of trying to move house but it was also i i it was a really weird kind of thing uh i I kind of got fatigued by it by the time it came out it it was ridiculous i was so 
massively hyped for it. But then the marketing machine kind of kicked in. And there was a point where I just felt almost kind of assaulted by the whole marketing of it that I just thought I'll be better off buying it on this kind of, you know, six months later or something and come to it fresh. Because there was a point where I was walking around the supermarket and I, there were like Star, Star Wars T-shirts. There were these huge kind of banners everywhere. And I, it just felt like I was inside a marketing machine. Yeah. Like kind of I was just I was the cattle being funneled in. And there was a point I came up to the counter and I was passing, and it was a Star Wars frozen pizza. And I just thought, this has gone too far. <laughs> you know, it just, it, this has kind of lost all meaning now when you're seeing a, a, a lightsaber lolly. And you, and you just think, uh, no, I, I kind of feel almost like I'm being manipulated now. It just, it just felt really strange. And there was also, there was a big game kind of came out around the same time, Star Wars Battlefront, which was kind of slightly lackluster as well. And it was, if you wanted to be harsh on EA, you could say a bit of a kind of cynical cash grab. And so, you know, I, I kind of like to come to this kind of thing fresh. I don't want to kind of sit there like a, a fan with my arms crossed, like saying, go on then, you know, impress me. And, then, and you know, with that jaded mindset, I want to, you know, yeah, come to it fresh. Did you see I, the Rogue One trailer? No, I'm I'm holding off that until I get the disc, and then uh, you know, once I watch one, I I I don't like to see these things too soon because what I find out is that I, I tend to get too involved in it, and then by the time that in fact, you know, anything comes out, I'm I'm almost kind of, yeah, I, I've I've kind of seen too much. I know I know what you're saying about the whole hype machine and all the rest of it because I thought I would see it more at the cinema than I actually did, and I I went on the same day, and I saw it at eleven o'clock in the morning in three D on IMAX. And then I went back that night and saw it again on a 2D showing. And then I haven't seen it since. And I thought I would go a lot more than I actually did. I think you yeah. went more times, didn't you, Steve? I saw it three times, although by the third time I was boring a bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I had enough. And, and I do agree with Mark about the hype machine. It was no question that running into its opening day, the, the level of hype and advertising and tie-ins was, was ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. It was just, uh, it, I, I was beginning to get a bit like Mark. I was beginning to get a bit annoyed with it. But, I mean, obviously I did go and see the film on its opening night, but um, partly to review it, but also because I wanted to see it. But I was getting, to, I was reaching saturation points as far as the, uh, the hype went and, and it was becoming quite annoying. Uh, yeah. When you're sort of seeing every, every product imaginable splash with Star Wars, you know, from batteries to pizzas. So, yeah, uh, and, yeah, and you know, I think that's maybe hit home because um, obviously the disc's out today, the time of the podcast going out, but there hasn't been that much hype with the disc release as I thought there would be and not as much tie-in and all the rest of it. So maybe the message got home that it was overdone and people were getting a bit sick of the overmarketing. Mm. Yeah, I think so. It was a good thing, really. It was just uh, insane. Although obviously it worked. I mean, $2 billion... <laughs> At the box office, you can't, can't complain about that. Yeah, and they're, they're going to do more than that on disc sales as well, aren't they? So, mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I might go at midnight just to make sure I get my copy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll I have do to... hope they've got some kind of a personal shopper in whatever supermarket Ed goes into. That'd be nice. <laughs> I need trousers and a Star Wars Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not touching your food. <laughs> oh, God, I hate shopping for food in Tesco's. They're just, just awful. If people don't feel the same way, there's some, clearly you just don't visit enough other supermarkets. I don't just, go to Tesco, so I, I really have no point of reference. The wrong quantities of the wrong food usually in really weirdly stocked quantities. It's like, <laughs> oh, hey, we've had a delivery of eight tons of it, but by the way, the uh, expiry date is tomorrow. Oh, brilliant. That's, uh, that's going to be easy to get balanced. So, And they change the layout too much. And the one in Milton Keynes demands a token for the trolley. Because it's in a chavy area that's most unsatisfactory. First world problems, eh? Well, uh, in a place where I have a choice of every other supermarket, it does count as shooting yourself in the foot. A let little, me uh, let me guess, you're a Waitrose. I do like Waitrose. Sainsbury's for me. In, <laughs> Sainsbury's for me too. Near yeah. on Waitrose quality, not quite as expensive, and the car park is un, is enclosed. I, I wonder. Nice big spaces. I wonder if uh, there's been some experiments done is to see what kind of person you are based on where you go and do your shopping yes of course they have um and uh yeah i mean basically it decided that if you shopped at farm foods you should be ground down and used as fertilizer um but it would be very uh, good fertilizer though with <laughs> that and nutrition in that food <laughs> we were still thinking um that uh i still think that there's mileage in uh, farm foods master chef 
which is exactly the same as normal MasterChef, but the contestants can only cook with ingredients found at farm foods, uh, which I think could be magnificent. I have but, to say I am a recent convert to both Aldi and the Dulce. I, I love some of the things they do. I just find it impossible to do a weekly shop there. They just don't have enough stuff. Yeah, and it's never the same stuff. Yeah. This is true. It's like, oh, I can buy a bicycle pump, but for whatever reason, they've uh, gone a bit low low on broccoli. So, you know. <laughs> now, I generally find um, there are some esoteric things in those stores, no question about it. I remember one year Laura was buying a reindeer, raw reindeer meat for uh, for Christmas. Um, but uh, generally the vegetables and, and the meat and stuff like that, you, you do get good quality and half the price of Sainsbury's. So. You ate the one, the one in Milton Keynes. The one in Milton Keynes smells yes. of despair. So I don't know. <laughs> oh, they all, I think they all are. No, like they that. don't. There's one in Buckingham, which is lovely. If that was my local Audi, I'd go much, much more. But the one in Milton Keynes just smells of sadness. And on the bombshell that <laughs> we really have gotten old because we're talking about where we do our weekly shop. <laughs> When when did this happen? You see this on the running order. It, it was uh, it was Ed in his trousers. <laughs> God, we're like a bunch of old men talking about. We are we're a gonna... bunch of old men. <laughs> I don't. It's a, this isn't a surprise. Or at least it's not a surprise to me. I think we could all talk longer about our gripes with supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> Why yes. does no one sell loose Granny Smiths anymore? We do with my Tesco. <laughs> Most places, it's like a pack of eight. Yeah, that's true, but you can't get loose Granny Smiths at home. <laughs> and why Why does only Morrison's sell Samphire? That's a bit of a weird <laughs> as well. Because it tastes like shit. That's Shut up. Exactly <laughs> the class of you, Ed. Heresy. <laughs> Samphire is awesome. I'm not keen. You've just got to make sure you don't you, you, you adjust the seasoning of everything else accordingly, because it is the seasoning for a lot of things. Okay, enough. Enough, please. Or we'll be on to nappies next and, and just draw a line at that. Right. Uh, so anyway, that is it for the podcast this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. Prince of the land of stench. Mark Hodgkinson. In nine hours and 23 minutes, you'll be mine. Ed Selly. Help. Stop it. Help. And Mark Burry. Where are you going with a head like that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mark, are we going to see you on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed now. I've got internet access and everything. I'm back in the modern world. Good, good. Yeah, so, where have you been, 1852? <laughs> Shut Yeah, you're a fine one to talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark AV forums for latest reviews, news and video. And, of course, leave us those five-star iTunes ratings. They have to be five stars, remember. And we'll read your name out on the podcast. Uh, that's next week, I think, end of the month. Uh, I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll see you again next Monday. Yeah.